My name is Mary Gladys Jones. I was born in Worcester County. I attended school in Worcester County up until junior high school. I attended a one-room school in Whaleyville, Maryland until the seventh grade. For the eighth and ninth grade, I attended Flower Street High School in Berlin. The reason for that was we did not have bus transportation. So my parents had to begin to pay for my education at the end of the seventh grade. I had to stay in the community from Monday through Friday, and then I came home. At the Flower Street Elementary School, my first principal was E. Jerry Williams, who became one of my mentors, and I admired him a great deal. I was a very quiet and shy child, but I listened attentively, and I suppose that paid off because I was a valedictorian of my class. After finishing Flower Street Elementary, my parents again had me to come to Salisbury and attend the old Salisbury Colored High School. I stayed with someone from Monday until Friday for the first year. The next year, I had an uncle and an aunt who worked at, so it was called Salisbury Normal School then. So we would leave home about six o'clock in the morning. They would take us to our place where we stayed until time to go to school. They would go to work. Then at the end of the day, they would come back and get all of us, and we would go home. It was usually about 7 o'clock, so it was a long, long day for us. But we survived because education was so important. I think I always knew that I wanted to be a teacher from the time I was 5 years old. I began school at 5, and I had a teacher who was a very, very good teacher, and I admired her so much that I made up my mind that that's what I wanted to be, was a teacher. And fortunately, I became one. After I finished Salisbury Colored High School, as it was called then, I was 16 years old. My parents sent me to Bowie Normal School. At that time, it was a three-year school. And in 1938, I graduated with a certificate for teaching, grades one through eight. I was not supposed to be in school at five, but we had an attendance uh, supervisor, and she had to travel all over the county, and travel was not as it is today. And by the time she got to our school, I'd been in school so long, and I had done so well that they allowed me to stay. So that's how I got a year ahead of my grade level. I always wanted to learn, and I had an uncle who spoke very well. And he encouraged me so much. He gave me my first dictionary. And he always told me to learn a new word. And he spoke well. So I think that had a lot to do with it. He influenced my life a great deal because of his high expectations of me. My first year was in Worcester County in Girdle Tree, Maryland. I was in a two-room school. 
I taught the primary grades, one through three, and the principal teacher taught the upper grades. She was such an excellent principal that I learned so much from her that I think that's what helped me to be able to become an administrator eventually. She was excellent. She was compassionate, she was patient, she was quite intelligent, and she established rapport with all of the children as well as the families. It was, we were just a big family in, the, in that community. And I still keep in touch with some of those people in that community where I worked for four years. I came to Wicomico County, and that's when I went to North Quantico in a Rosenwald school, a one-room school. There I taught all seven grades. Usually I had about 25, from 25 to 30 students. I still see some of them today. At that time, there was not, uh, I wanted to do something. At that time, either you had to be a teacher or a nurse. Other opportunities were not, other job opportunities were not available to us. And the teacher in the community was a person that was valued so much, valued and respected. And usually they were very versatile and they stayed in the community. Not only did they teach us in the classroom, but they were involved in all of our social activities. I had one teacher who was very, very good with music, and that's how I learned all of my classical and semi-classical uh, music. And she played for our church choir, all of the choirs, and I just had a love for music, and she encouraged me along with a minister's wife who was very good with music. And she also played and sang. So I got to use my talent in that way with their help. So I didn't have much choice. I don't think I'd have chosen differently, but that was just about where we were at that time. We could not do the other jobs, the other opportunities were not open for us. Uh, my first teaching uh, position was in Whitehaven, Maryland, and I had 20 students. I still remember their names, and uh, uh, my name is Lois Wilburn, but it was Lois Shipp at that time, S-H-I-P-P. -P. And uh, when I got married, uh, I married a fellow from Columbus, Ohio, and his name was Thomas Wilburn and he got a job down to Maryland State uh, after we got married. But uh, I enjoyed being at Whitehaven. Uh, I can remember all the names of my students that I had. I have uh, five that became teachers and one a supervisor. And uh, I think most of them graduated, I think only two did not graduate from high school. And um, I, I think that's wonderful that, that with the limited amount of books and everything that we had, that those children were able, you know, to accomplish what they did. You taught at the One Room School. How long did you teach there, and where did you go after that? I taught at White Haven Elementary School for one year. Then I moved on to Batipquin, where I had first, second, and third grade. That was a two-room school where you had first, second, and third grade. And you had fourth, fifth, and sixth in, in another room. And I stayed there eight years. And then I went to Salisbury Elementary to what at that time they called special class, where I had uh, uh, children that needed attention. Can you tell us a little bit about what a typical day at your school was like? Well, the children came in, and uh, the one made sure that the fire in the pot belly stove was burning so we could be warm. And uh, they got in their seats, and uh, we had morning program where we had uh, prayer, Pledge of Allegiance, song, Bible verse, 
and then maybe a, uh, a favorite song that they wanted to uh, sing, and then uh, we would start our lesson. I would start with the first grade. I had one student in the first grade, and uh, after I finished with that student, I would go to the second grade, and I had two students in the second grade. And uh, uh, while the first grade was doing seat work, then I was teaching the second grade. And uh, that followed uh, the outline for the day. You did not have disruptive children as we have today, where they talk out, they sharpen the pencils, and all of those kind of things. The routine was established, it was very structured, and we followed it we had no trouble with following directions. And I guess it's because in our homes, our parents expected us to follow directions. And I was always an obedient child. I didn't have any interruptions because the, at that time, the children knew they were in school, they were there to learn, and they knew that there wasn't any foolishness. So, <laughs> so they uh, went on with their work while I taught the first grade. We had a schedule that almost looked like a puzzle because most of the classes were 15 and 20 minutes long. And you would leave one class with their assigned work to do and move to the next. Primary grades had to be taught reading twice a day. So you did that in the morning with your first and second grade, and you repeated it in the afternoon. Plus, you got in all of the other subjects. There were 15 and 20 minute periods, but you went to work immediately. There, you didn't have to wait to get discipline. When it was time for that class, you just moved quietly to the next group, the group you had left, continued with their work and finished it. If they finished their work, there was always enrichment work or books or a library table, and they knew how to get up quietly and go there and make use of their time. We did not have wasted time. We could only cover it because we didn't have all the discipline problems that they have today. We could not take 20 minutes to get the children settled down your class period would, would be over. So there was discipline, and very seldom did you have anyone who did not follow the rules. Parents, family, the family structure. We knew that we were going home to a father and a mother. We knew that we were going to be taken to church, and the, or they were going to go to church with us. Whatever activities we were involved in, they were involved in them. That makes the greatest difference. And we knew that we had the support of the parents. If a child misbehaved, all you had to do was mention the idea that I must contact your parents. And that was enough to settle them down. We didn't always like our strict discipline, but now I can truly appreciate it. It was very nice. It was, um, we didn't have problems like we have today. We knew what to do. Um, everybody was assigned to do something. We did it. We respected her, and she was a very good teacher, a very good teacher. I was starting with the first grade, and uh, what lesson that I had uh, for her, we, we would do it because I only had one student in that first grade. And after I finished with her, I would give her work related to the lesson that she had just had and then move on to the second and do the same thing, move on to the third, etc. They didn't have any problems with the other children talking or what have you. They would go on with their work. And um, when I got into... Uh, a classroom, you know, uh, I would divide my reading groups in, into groups, and that's what helped me with that one-room school. We did not have, uh, like we have teacher's aides and, and volunteers, we did not have that. 
each person was responsible for his or her lessons. Uh, if they had a problem when they went home, usually the parents or, or an older child could help them, an older brother or sister. But no, that wasn't something that we had to deal with. I think we, do, we have done so much for them. We worked hard. We struggled for everything that we were able to get. And we knew that we had to do well, and we wanted to do well. But I think we do too much. And children are, have not been taught to be kind to each other, to be helpful. And it makes the biggest difference when those family values have not been formulated. We just came up in homes where it was a family. And we knew that our parents expected certain things of us. And there were consequences if we didn't. I know in Matipquin, they, well, in Whitehaven and Matipquin, we had lamp lights. And that's how we, you know, if it was on a dark day, you know, the, the trouble that we had. But we still went on and talked. But in Matipquin, I remember uh, having this May Day where the children wrapped a, a, a maypole and all to raise money uh, to have electric uh, turn on. And we raised enough money to do it. Then that meant we had a hot plate where we could have hot lunches. Uh, and the children didn't have to go home for lunch. We'd have a great big pot of soup, and they could, uh, you know, enjoy that. We learned to do everything. I was sharing with the young people yesterday. When I taught here, there was no central heat. I lived on the corner just from this building. I would leave home early and come and shake down the coal fire, the coal stove, put the coal in, get the fire started so it would be warm when the other two teachers who came from Salisbury and Allen, it would be warm in here. When I was in the one room school in North Quantico, we did not have custodian or janitor. We would use a larger young boy, one of the larger boys, and they would do that work. And they got maybe a few dollars for doing that. But I have made fires. I have swept floors. I have oiled the floors. Well, the books came from uh, the Board of Education. And most of the time, uh, the uh, black schools got the leftover books or the, the secondhand books. And some of the pages may be missing out of that, but we were able you know, to go on because at the end of all of this, I still had uh, uh, five teachers that came out of that one room school. We got the old desks when the White children got the new desks. We got the old desks. We got the old books. They got the new ones. But we had to take care of those books. I have even had to uh, take each book, go through it, to see if there's any damage, and allocate a fee if it were damaged more than it should have been for just ordinary wear. We made our own seat work. We made our own flashcards. We made our own uh, uh, charts that we had to use uh, because those things were not given to us. There would be seat work that would go along with whatever subject you were teaching. If I happened to be teaching grammar, I would make up seat work to use the verbs or whatever part of speech we might be working on. We did completion, multiple choice, true, false. We built our own tests. 
uh, they even learned how to do predictions results. Uh, they might be worded differently today, but some of the very same things that they're doing today as basics, we did those things also. And in uh, the classroom, we would make uh, different things. And I remember the children making these autograph books out of wood and they, they didn't have the, the, neat, uh, the uh, pen that you use to do it. And we would take a hot needle, I mean a hot uh, uh, nail and make designs on the outside. And we would sell those to get money to buy supplies to be used, uh, you know, uh, for the next year. There was no central heating, no plumbing. We took care of all of the custodial work, basically, ourselves. When I went there uh, with supplies, you know, from the uh, teacher before me, and the money that we would make by selling these different th uh, projects that we did, we would use that money to buy projects, I mean, um, uh, money for projects next year. If we had workbooks, the children had to buy them. And if we had newspapers like current events, if the children could not afford to buy them, the teachers bought them for them so that each child would have them. It was follow-up work on uh, the lessons that they had had. And uh, while I was with the other uh, classes, they would uh, have that done so that when I got over there, we could check it, see that it was right, and then I'd move on. Uh, you know, with their lesson. When, um, after the, uh, while she was teaching maybe the first, second grade um, students, uh, the uh, third and fourth would finish their work and they would sit and listen to what she was teaching in the first grade. And, you know, uh, children in the first grade when she was teaching the fifth and sixth graders, they would sit and listen because by the time they got to that grade, they would know a whole lot of things. Mm -hmm. If I was in the second grade, by the time I got to the fourth or the fifth grade, I know that. Mm -hmm. I could say, I know that. Why? Because I was listening when the teacher was teaching and you, you did, you, you learned a lot. I did all of the reports. We had to do the reports mathematically. Uh, there was no computer or anything. We did all of that, the, the summary, all of those things. We had the basic text and the materials that we gathered ourselves. Like when we attended teachers' meetings, we would purchase material. There was no educational supply store on the, on the shore. And we had to plan out, make our own seat work, run off our own seat work on a very, very old type of printer. It was very hard. We struggled. It was not easy to do, but it was just a part of us that we knew it had to be done. So we did it without complaining. Sometimes students would ask the teacher, may I go and help so-and-so with work? May I help? And it did, it helped a lot. There were some grades that, uh, some subjects we just had to combine. There was no way that we would teach all of them when you had seven grades to teach and you had to go through a schedule so your spelling might be combined, you knew your music was going to be combined, your physical ed would be combined. So uh, there, is an, there was an advantage in that. And you listened because it was quiet in your classroom. In the, in the country, you didn't have a problem with uh, discipline, but the older kids would always want to help 
the younger ones. I don't know why, or maybe it was because it come from the home, because um, there were always older siblings in the, in the school with them. And sometimes that was good. If you had a class and you were teaching a new concept and you knew that five more minutes you would be able to get that concept over, a bell's not going to ring so they have to leave, uh, you could do that. And maybe you skip that class that day, you could come back and finish or do a better job rather than just do surface teaching. I just believe that if you do a job well, most of the children are going to get it. And I often told my children, if all of you fail, then I have failed. So it's my job to begin again and do that lesson over. I'm the one who needs to do the lesson over so that you will be successful. You should not have a class that fails. Uh, sometimes it was very funny. You might ask an upper grade child a question and they might not know and a little one over in the corner in the third or fourth grade might raise the hand and you would call on that person and they would sort of be astonished that that child knew and I forgot. So that made it interesting. I started out with uh, where they were segregated down in Wetipkin, uh, uh, Whitehaven, Wetipkin, and this was also a segregated uh, experience that I had with the with the um, children in special class. Mm -hmm. I did not uh, go to uh, Glen Avenue to 1966 okay. when uh, desegregation came along. It was easier because I only had the three grades, but as far as the uh, respect and uh, the parents uh, cooperating, it was the same. Mm -hmm. I didn't have any trouble <laughs> in that classroom with uh, you know the all-white students. It was fine because I had a beautiful class and the, the parents cooperated, and and uh, I didn't have you know any trouble with that transition, and. Uh, any time there was anything to be done, those parents were right there to help me. Do you have any other memories and comments about uh, about your one-room school uh, versus your, your more modern schools? Uh, well, children don't have respect for each other like we did when we were going to those one-room schools. And what do you think uh, are some of the reasons for that? Do you think they just are doing other things or? Oh, I, I, I really don't know the reason. <laughs> and then it comes a lot of time from your environment. See, and when you're raised in the country, everybody knows everybody. Mm -hmm. In the city, it's different. I, I feel that it was more or, or less that the parents had taught them you know, to respect your teacher, and you didn't, you know, have a lot of that. But uh, like I said today, the parents don't respect uh, the teachers, therefore the children are not going to respect the teachers. One year, um, after I'd been there, I guess, ooh, maybe five, six years, uh, this third grade class, the parents asked the principal, <laughs> could the entire class moved to my room and be in the fourth grade because what would happen uh, great many times they would move certain uh, students to you know this teacher and certain uh, uh, students to another teacher but that year the parents wanted me to uh, wanted me to have the whole class and I happened to have met one of the parents the other day and talked to her for a long time and uh, they, they were very cooperative. I remember having this Christmas play and uh, we made up, the, the teachers in the fourth grade made up the play that they wanted for Christmas and it was Christmas around the world. And each teacher uh, picked out the country that they wanted and wrote the script for that uh, country. And I remember uh, this mother coming out and painting the scenery 
for, because uh, we had Mexico, painting the scenery, uh, you know, for Mexico, plus making the piñana uh, for, and they, they would come out every day and, you know, help with uh, something that we needed done. Because we struggled so very, very hard, and that's what makes me stick with this job that I have now, because I know that our cause will be lost unless we are here to try to help these children just to understand that this isn't something that is given to you. You cannot take it for granted. It is something that you need to empower you. It's something that you need to change your lifestyle. It is something you need just to improve your quality of life. So that is one of the reasons why I have stayed here so very long. Nobody, none of my family is happy that I work as hard as I do now. But it's just something that I told one little boy, I said, oh, I just wish I could open my head and open yours and take lots and lots of these things that I know and just put them in there so you would have them. Many of the things that we have gone through, not just that I have gone through, but the teachers, my colleagues, my friends, the difficulties and the struggles are so, were so great that it's painful to recall them. I, I guess that's one reason why I liked uh, St. Michael's School, because the parent, teacher, and children was uh, similar to the one, the one room school. Um, they respected each other. You didn't have those problems. They got along well with each other. And what were some of the changes? How was it different going to the uh, Salisbury High School than it was in the One Room Schoolhouse? Oh, we had halls to walk, <laughs> monitors on the hall. We um, didn't change classes in the seventh grade, but when we got to eighth grade, we did. We were in the main building then. Um, the students respected their teachers. In the city, they have very little respect for themselves or for the teacher or anybody in authority. They did not have respect. When I left the one room school in Quantico, North Quantico, I went to Allen. That's the place where I said that I can say now. I can go and ring the bell and call a class. I have just that many young people there that I have taught that I have enough for a class. So it's always such a pleasure to go back there and now to be able to relate to them as adults. It's just such a wonderful feeling. In 1953, I was appointed to the building where we are today, it was then called the Old Morris Street Colored Elementary School. It was a three-room school. I taught in the middle room. I had three grades. This was like a growing area for me. I knew the families, and that's what makes it so fascinating today, because I'm dealing with a third generation. And I just think that I've just been so wonderfully blessed and privileged to be able to do that. It makes me feel very, very good, because that was my first teaching experience. I was young and, and you know, the more or less learning, and um, I'm just glad I had that much imp impression on them for them to do that. 
because I have uh, one down in Berlin that's teaching. I have uh, one here in uh, that's living in Salisbury that I taught she went in the teaching. Her brother became supervisor, and uh, let's see, uh, another uh, student that I had, Ann, uh, she is in, I think, Baltimore teaching. So maybe I hope I did. <laughs> I've learned so much from them. So we've learned from each other, but I, I it makes me just feel wonderful, and when I can say, I taught your grandfather, I taught your mother, and they will find me, many of them I have forgotten, but they always remember me, and they have some special ways that they remember me that I will not share. <laughs> All my uh, students in my uh, one-room school I still love them, and they were the ones that uh, helped me on my way. And I enjoyed uh, uh, teaching in that one-room school <laughs> and the two-room school, too. I think it's just a privilege to be able to share this history that I have. And I'm, I'm very humble, and I'm very grateful to have this chance to share it. It's quite different today. Uh, the last time I visited a school, I noticed that they did not have the groups uh, like I was saying, you know, that helped me when I uh, was in the classroom. And I would like to see that come back. I would like to see more respect for the teachers and, uh, and for the children, for each other. Um, because that's one thing I did not have in that one room school. Uh, although most of those uh, children were related but still, you know, the children will bicker among themselves, but we didn't have that. And I'd like to see that come back. I would like to see the parents are more cooperative with the, with the uh, uh, teachers and, uh, and, and respect the, uh, the children, too. The children that I had in the classroom just behind me were children who have gone on to make names for themselves throughout our country. Some have gone away and stayed long enough to come back and retire, and they're here with us now. Our friendship is very strong. They still respect me, and we have loads of fun together as adults. Having 54 children in a classroom, I did all of my subjects. And when we studied health, and we talked about a healthy breakfast, I began that healthy breakfast at my home, finished it here, and the children would have breakfast. When it came time to teach about a good lunch, we prepared the lunch, and we had it here. And we always shared with the other teachers. It was just like a big, happy family. We had lots of work to do here. But our community supported us. The parents were fine. And in this area, most of the people were homeowners. And that made a great difference in the environment in which we find ourselves today. It is quite different. No, I again, hope but, that uh, children will take advantage of what they have today and not waste their time in, in school and give the teachers, you know, a rough time. Because uh, it, it really hurts me to see that you've got to have policemen in the schools, you know, uh, because of what's going on. Having a lady for a principal was very good, she was excellent. We had a primary teacher that children still talk about today, how much she taught them and how great she was with them. We stayed here until it was time to move to what 
we call Cedar Lane. Cedar Lane is now Fruitland Primary. From here, we went into a new school. It was our first time to have a chance to enter into a new building. The children were very appreciative of being able to go into a new building and having all of the things that they had there that we did not have here. Lovely library, a cafeteria. It was just a great experience for them. And we enjoyed Cedar Lane and we had some outstanding young people who came out of Cedar Lane also. And I uh, thank you for interviewing me and letting <laughs> me tell my story. I'd like to share with you why I decided to begin a tutorial program. I retired in 1981 from Prince Street School. And by the way, I always had good principles and that helps a great deal. And when I retired, I was wondering what I would do with myself. And Mr. Foxwell called possibly in July and they needed someone to be in charge of migrant education because there were still migrants in Wicomico County at that time. The lady who had been in charge of that had suggested that he contact me to see if I would like to be a part of the migrant education program. It was very rewarding, very revealing to me. I had five schools that I traveled to. I was given a room where I would work with two or three children, taking whatever materials I might need or I thought they might need and following the, lesson plan, the lessons of the teacher. And I worked with them in small groups. And I found out that it was so very effective to work in small groups one-on-one. -on -one. Some children need that. And after, I, after that program phased out in 1984, People in this community began to call me and ask me if I would tutor their children. I did not want, I had done some private tutoring, I did private tutoring at my home, but I did not want my dining room to become a classroom. So at that time, this building was available and my husband happened to be one of the trustees and I asked if I could use one of these rooms here since I had taught here to begin to teach the children on Saturday mornings. And that's how our tutorial program began. And when I began to have children come here on Saturday morning to tutor them, a lady, Miss Mary B. Pinkett, who was once a councilwoman attended this school and lived in this community. She came for 15 years. On Saturday mornings, we opened this building and tutored children. She said, this is one of the last things that I will give up. So about five or six years ago, she stopped coming to tutor. I continued but I changed it from weekends until we had it on maybe Tuesdays and Thursdays. This was done on our own. We were not getting grants or anything of that kind. We were just doing this on our own with the community keeping this building open. We had a community organization and they kept the building open, maintained it for us and allowed us to use it. And that's why I have been here. This is my 23rd year here doing this tutorial program. About five years ago, 
some of my former students decided to pay tribute and they dedicated the room to the, just behind me with a plaque over it as my classroom. It is my hope that one day that classroom will become a place to house the archives and the many certificates and plaques and the things that I have accumulated. I have asked my children to see that those things are placed in this building. In fact, now I'm working, this is a building that has a rich history. It's been here since 1912. It has be, always been a two or three room school, depending upon the population at the time. The room that they have given to me as my room was built onto this building, I would say maybe in the 1970s, Shurup had this building for a classroom or for a school and they put that room on. Of course, that destroyed the historical value of the building. This is really a, a historical building with the exception that we have add, that has been added on. I'm in the process now of trying to preserve some of this rich history that we have. I am not skilled to use all the technology but we have young people who are here working who have that skill, and we plan to preserve some of those valuable documents and pictures and many of the things that you see here. And we have many, many more things that we have already assembled and classified for the archives. That's one of my goals now before it's too late for me to be able to get all of those things organized and have the archives so that it will go on into many, many years when people can look back and say, this was once the old Fruitland Morris College Elementary School.